I would like to begin this evening's message by welcoming uh, all of you. Welcome to our church members. Welcome to our guests, and I'd like to give a special welcome uh, to any of those who are who maybe are online and will be listening to this uh, later this week, uh, especially if you're from the STEM community. Uh, this has been a very difficult week for our local community, especially those who are connected to STEM School Highlands Ranch. Uh, my family and I, we are part of the STEM community. All four of our children go there. Uh, my wife volunteers there often. We have a nephew who goes to STEM. Uh, I, I have coached or still coach several students who go there, and we also have many friends uh, who attend STEM as well. So if you're uh, here with us today in our service or listening online, we just want to, want to welcome you. And on behalf of the church, I just want to extend to you our sympathy and our love to this community in such a difficult situation. And we especially extend our sympathy uh, to the families of those who were shot. And, and we would like to especially uh, extend our condolences to the Castillo family whose brave son Kendrick laid down his life to save his friends. So we love you guys and we are praying for you. In addition to this, before we begin the message, I have a special burden for the teachers, the administration, the security, and the local law enforcement. Before diving into the message, I want to comfort you and encourage you by saying this tragedy, it's not your fault. You have done so many things to try and prevent this. You have done so many things to respond to this well and to be ready for this. But guess what? You're not God. You cannot possibly prevent every evil. And this shooting, it was not the fault of the administration or law enforcement or teachers or security or any of that. It, it did not happen because you guys are failures. Instead, this shooting happened because of the sin of the shooters. It is the shooters who are guilty. It is the shooters who are to blame. It's not the fault of the administration, of law enforcement, of STEM staff, or of STEM security. Listen, sin is crafty. Sin is brilliant. Sin is all pervasive. Sin touches the entire created order. And sin finds a way to infiltrate everything. And sin has a way of reaping its awful destruction regardless of what rules and procedures are in place. Sin found a way to take down the World Trade Center. Sin finds a way to get across illegal borders and smuggle drugs. Sin finds a way in prisons where there's tons of security to still manage to have weapons there to kill other prisoners. It is not the fault of leaders. It's the fault of those who commit the sin. And so, I just... If, if, if you're listening to this and you are part of the staff or the security or law enforcement administration, I just want to begin by ministering to you and, and telling you, please don't carry false guilt and blame yourself for this. It is not your fault. And I also want to publicly thank you for the efficiency with which you responded. Your efficient, quick response was used by God to save many lives. So don't blame yourself uh, I want to thank you uh, for uh, all that you've done and all that you do. So, okay, let's go ahead and begin our message. I have titled this sermon, Hoping in God in an Age of School Shootings. And the purpose of this sermon is to serve as a starting point for thinking about how to hope in God in tragedy. As I already mentioned in the announcements, I am under no delusion that all there is to be said about this uh, situation is going to be covered in this sermon. I just hope that this sermon gets the ball rolling of us setting our minds in God and in His Word. And so, <clears throat> at our church, we do not believe that this tragedy or any tragedy is too big for God. At our church, we strongly believe that the gospel of Jesus Christ alone, it is sufficient to bring eternal life to sinners. At our church, we believe that the Word of God, which is the Bible, it is sufficient to reveal the mind of God on all that we need to know, including where to place our hopes and how to process our grief. We don't believe 
anything is bigger than the God of the Bible. We do not believe that the issues of any tragedy somehow fall outside of the sufficiency of Scripture or of the Gospel. And we don't ever believe that there's ever a point at any time that our God's arm is shortened through suffering and He is incapable of bringing supernatural hope and salvation and comfort and peace because the suffering is too big for Him. We don't believe that. Instead, it's with unwavering conviction and with blood earnest seriousness and with great joy that is mingled with our grief that we gladly and plainly labor to lift up the glory of God in Jesus Christ tonight. And our hope is that as you look to Christ in tragedy, you will find peace, you will find life, and you will find hope. Not in yourself or not in any scheme of man but in the living God and in His glory through Jesus Christ. So, that being our aim tonight, if it is my goal to get you to hope in God, and it is, I have to begin to achieve that goal by deconstructing your hope in anything else. So I'm going to warn you, the first half of this sermon is not going to be encouraging, but it is. The second half of the sermon will be very encouraging. So don't fall asleep. <clears throat> when, you look, here, when you look at this tragedy, when you look at this shooting that resulted in the death of one young man and the wounding of eight others, and when you look at the emotional scarring of a community, my question to you is how do you process that? What do you believe in your heart are the real problems. Why did it happen? These questions are crucial because here's why. The way that you diagnose the problems connected to the school shooting, it will determine what you believe the solutions are. For example, if you think the problem involved in school shootings is primarily a lack of security at school, then your solution will be Increased security. If you think the problem is primarily that there are not enough laws in place to protect kids, then your solutions will be increased legislation. If you think the problem primarily is a lack of sufficient procedures at schools to prevent these things, then your solution will be to implement new procedures. If you think the problem is primarily that people can get a brain sickness that causes them to kill other people, then your solution is going to be medication. What do all of these problems and all of these solutions have in common that I shared with you? All of these problems all of the diagnoses of these problems, and all of their accompanying solutions, they're all earthly problems. And therefore, all of the solutions are all things that man believes he is capable of fixing through his own ingenuity. Therefore, in the examples I gave, if these things are primarily the problem, then, the, then these solutions will be sufficient. Man will be able to be his own helper and man will be able to be the solver of his own problems. Now as a little caveat here, I want to say there is a place for procedures and legislations. R R Romans 13 tells us God gives us government to rule and to, you know, to put things in place to protect society. And so being prepared and trying to prevent school shootings and having processes uh, to, to respond well, those are good, godly things. But when they're the ultimate things that you hope in, the Bible calls that idolatry. And what I want to suggest to you tonight is what if the problems, the deepest problems and the deepest causes of school shootings, what if they're not primarily earthly things? What if the primary root cause of these shootings are spiritual? And what if the solving of these spiritual problems is not something man is capable of achieving? If that were the case, 
and it is, would you have any hope? Would you, are you capable of, look at, of looking at the problems and seeing them as deeply spiritual and realizing man has no power to help himself? Are you capable of looking at that and still having hope? If the answer is no, you have misplaced hopes. Hopefully, by the end of the sermon, your answer will be yes, because your hope is not in man, it's in God. And tonight, I'm going to argue with all of my heart from the Word of God that the problems surrounding school shootings are spiritual. And we are completely incapable of solving our own problems. In fact, we only make the problems worse because sin lives inside of us and we advocate false beliefs as a society all the time that spread sin. <coughs> Since the shootings that took place at Columbine almost exactly 20 years ago, how are things going in relation to mass shootings? I looked it up on the internet. You know how many mass shootings there were in 1999? Seven. Seven mass shootings in 1999. Columbine was one of them. Do you, I heard the day of the shooting is like the rest of you. We were watching the news. Uh, I heard on the news this week that the STEM school shooting was the 35th mass shooting this year. That is a 500% increase. Listen, things are not getting better. After Columbine, we were, were called to trust in our riches. We're called to trust in legislation and procedures and the goodness of man and godless secular psychology and the false gospel of self-esteem. And where did it get us? It got us to a place of a 500% increase in school shootings. Things are not getting better. The reason why things are not getting better, even though we spend tons of money on this, even though uh, my kids, and I'm sure your kids too, there's, there's all kinds of trainings and drills with school shootings. There's tons of, I mean, the, the, the police responded in two minutes to this thing. It was, it was amazing. But even though these procedures are so much better, why are there a 500% increase in shootings? It's because procedures aren't the real problem. The real problem is sin. And since 1999, we have not looked to God. Things have only gotten worse. They've only gotten more violent. They've only gotten more deadly. I mean, look, Colin, how many people that was at 13? I might be wrong. I, th I think it was roughly 13 people. Look, we've had shootings since then that killed 25 people, 60 people. I mean, it's getting not only more frequent, it's getting more deadly. And the primary reason for this is because we refuse to look to the God of the Bible. We refuse to look to the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We refuse to humble ourselves and seek His face. We refuse to repent of our sins. We refuse to hope in the one true God who can do for us what we can't do for ourselves. And as long as we continue to misdiagnose the problems, as long as we continue to put ourselves in the center of the solutions, we will continue to become more and more godless and violent. So I want to take you now on a journey of what the Bible says is true about mankind and what the real problem is. For those of you who are new, I have lots of scriptures in my notes. It's sometimes hard to keep up with it. If you want a copy of the manuscript, this is all written out, let me know. I will email it to you. We'll have all the scripture references in there. <clears throat> the Bible tells us that at the basic and most fundamental level, the cause of all tragedies, the cause of all suffering, the cause of all evil, and the cause of all death is sin. The Bible tells us in Genesis 1 that God created human beings, both male and female, in the image of God. And prior to the entrance of sin, all of God's creation, including mankind, was good. 
And as image bearers, we are designed and created by God to need God. We are created to know God. We are created to walk with God, to worship God, to follow God. We're made to enjoy God. We're made to fellowship with God. We're made to obey God. We're made to serve God. We are made to have our entire existence centered on the glory and presence of our magnificent Creator, God. That's why we exist. We were not created to be God. We were created to worship God. We were not created to find life in ourselves. We were created to find life in Him by gladly honoring God as the Lord of all creation. <clears throat> now in the Garden of Eden, in chapter 2 of Genesis, after creating Adam and Eve, God commanded Adam and Eve not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And by the time we get to chapter 3 of the book of Genesis, we see that Satan crept into the garden. And through Satan's temptations, he led Adam and Eve into sin. And to lead Adam and Eve into sin, Satan sowed doubts into their minds about the truthfulness of God's Word and about the goodness of God's intentions. Most profoundly, however, Satan assaulted them with the irresistible temptation that if they ate of the forbidden fruit, they would become like God Himself. And it was this temptation that they were not able to resist. The temptation to substitute themselves for God. The temptation to be the Lord of their own lives. The temptation to exalt their wisdom above God's wisdom. The temptation to exalt their glory above God's glory. The temptation to put themselves at the center of their universe at the expense of the glory of God. That temptation was too strong for them to resist and they gave in and they sinned against God. Genesis 3 tells us that when sin entered the world, the entire creation was cursed. The entrance of sin broke Adam and Eve's relationship with the holy God. And they, they became guilty. And they fell under His righteous judgment. And sin turned them from being good creatures, the good creatures they're declared to be in Genesis 1, to being evil. And after the entrance of sin, God says about mankind, left to ourselves, this is what's true of us. Genesis 6, 5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Ouch. This means that everyone who has ever descended from Adam and Eve, which is the entire human race, Fundamentally, we are sinful like they are. Fundamentally, the manifestation of our sin is just like them. We put ourselves in the place of God. We are born lost and clueless about who the real God is. We are born not knowing what our identity is supposed to be in Him. And we live our lives apart from God by making ourselves God. We don't seek to place God at the center of our lives. Instead, we deny Him. Or at best, we make Him a mere accessory to lives that are all about our own glory. We don't love God with all of our heart and soul. We don't receive His Word and submit to it and love it and cherish it. Instead, when we don't like what it says about God's standards on sexuality or money or lust or anger or greed or what it means to worship Him rightly or the exclusive claims that salvation is only in Christ, when we don't like those things, we then suppress the truth of God's Word in our unrighteousness. We say, oh, I, don't, I don't believe that part of the Bible. We rebel against Him and we refuse to give ourselves fully to His Lordship over us. And in our self-obsession, we either flatly deny Him or we treat God like a Christmas ornament. And what I mean is, we might bring God out for a few weeks to be seen, but then the rest of the year we stuff Him in the attic of our lives while we pursue what we really care about. Namely, our own vanity, our own greed, and our own glory at the expense of God and others. 
apart from the Lord, even the things that we think we do that are good, most of the time, they're, they're, they're all, it's all just done. We do a good thing to make ourselves look good, to be praised, to be seen by men, or maybe to manipulate somebody. And the evil that we commit, like thefts and murder and sexual immorality and slander and greed, we justify this evil over and over and over again because we are our own standard of righteousness and we reject God's clear command that He has given us in Scripture. This is the human plight. This is what we are apart from God. Sin's not just something we commit. Sin's something that we are apart from the Lord. The Bible tells us in Psalm 53.3, this sums up mankind apart from God. Psalm 53.3, they have all fallen away. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good. Not even one. We are not basically good. We are corrupt. We are sinful. We are dead spiritually. And we are blind. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. Most of you in this room are parents. Let me ask you a question. I know I didn't have to do this. Did you have to teach your kids to sin? I didn't. My parents didn't need to teach me how to sin. I came out with a PhD in sinning. Why? Because we're not basically good. We are corrupted and sinful by nature. Now, as corrupt, sinful beings, sometimes we can, even in our sin, become religious in a way that is blasphemous. We might believe in a God that we create in our own minds. A God we make into our image. We create gods that have our standards of right and wrong. We create gods that will tolerate what our sinful flesh craves. We create gods who will allow us to prove our worthiness and our greatness through our attempts at good deeds that are really nothing more than vain pursuits of our own self-exaltation. We may have gods that we believe in, but until we come to a saving knowledge of Christ, these gods are not the God of Scripture. And therefore, they are nothing more than fictitious idols. They are no more real than Thor. And we create these false gods because we love our sin. We create them because we want to hope in our riches. We want to hope in our resourcefulness. We want to hope in our strength. We want to hope in our perceived goodness. And we want to hope in our own abilities. That's how we live apart from God. And so when people like this have kids, if I'm like this, and then I have a kid, what do you think I'm going to raise my kid to do? Same thing. We raise our kids to be like us and to live with themselves at the center of the universe. We teach them to make excuses for their sins. We teach them that when they fail or when they, when they have sinned, they need to feel sorry for themselves. We teach them that if they ever have a, time, a hard time, oh, we're not going to let you learn and grow through it. We're just going to coddle you. We teach them to hope in themselves. We model to them that God is not the center of our lives. And we show them by our own example that God is not worth loving and serving. And we will pamper and spoil our children until they become entitled. And when something doesn't go their way, when somebody doesn't like them, when somebody says something mean to them, they fall apart. And in extreme cases, because they're so self-absorbed and self-pitying, they will justify destroying others to get their revenge, even to the point of shooting a school. And the results of such pervasive global sinfulness it's just what God said it would be. Namely, death. He told Adam and Eve, when you sin, you will die. And this death is twofold. First, it is spiritual. It is the death of being separated from God and not knowing Him and having our whole nature corrupted. And the death is also physical. One day, everyone in this room, our bodies are going to die. It is the destiny of all of us. And so, 
The Bible makes it very clear in no uncertain terms. You can also read Romans chapter 3, verses 1 through 20. All suffering, all evil, all death, it comes from sin, which at its core can be summed up as living in a way where we make ourselves the center of the universe at the expense of the glory of God and at the expense of the good of others. So I ask you, with the Bible declaring this is true, this is who we are apart from God, why would we ever want to hope in man? Why would we ever want to hope in man's abilities, in man's resources, in man's strength, or in man's goodness? 35 shootings this year with a consistently increasing culture of deadly violence. It is screaming out to us the biblical truth that man is not basically good. We cannot solve our own spiritual problems because we're part of the problem. And because everybody in their sin is part of the problem, therefore there is no safe place that we can create on the planet. Because no matter where you go, sin's going to follow you. Evil's going to be present. And death is a reality. I saw a statistic this morning that claims over 150,000 people die every day. And these deaths occur everywhere on the planet. Where will you go to escape danger and death? What place is truly safe from disease or heart attacks or cancer or accidents or natural disasters or murder? It is a delusion and a fairy tale to hope in man or in false notions of earthly safety. I met with some uh, some people this week who are in the school while the shooting was taking place. Met with them, met with their parents, and we had some really encouraging conversations, and it was a joy to see them hope in God. And what I want to do now is <clears throat> some of the things I heard and learned uh, from these people, I want you to think about hoping in man in light of school shootings for a second. Let's think about this. When people tell you in a horrible tragedy like this, oh man, you just got to be strong. You're a strong person. Let me ask you a question. Do you feel strong when you are hiding under your desk as you hear gunshots ringing through the school and you don't know if you're going to be the next one shot? You feel strong then? You don't. As a parent, if you have tons of money, but you hear there's a shooting in your child's school and you can't get in touch with your kid and there is nothing that you can do, what good is your money at that point? Are you feeling particularly resourceful when you have no idea if your kid's alive or not? When your classmate is lying on the ground bleeding and the shooter is coming your way and you fear you're about to die and meet a just God with nothing but a lifetime of sin and a failure to love God as you ought, are you brimming with confidence that you are basically a good person in that moment? And when you see that these mass shootings, they're not just in poor third world countries, but they find their way into middle, upper class, suburban America, and your delusions of places being safe are shattered, do you feel particularly secure and protected? Why would you ever want to put your hope in man? In order to feel comforted while you hope in man, you have to lie to yourself and deceive yourself that man is basically good, that man is all powerful to stop evil, and that man can solve man's problems, and that man can create safe places for us. Guess what? There are many ways to deal with that objection. I'll just stick to this. 35 shootings this year are telling you that this hope is false and it is vain. And so I plead with you, stop hoping in man. We are not solving our own problems on our own, nor can we. We are making them worse. Okay, so, so far at this point in the sermon, everything's just been like totally depressing. 
And I warned you ahead of time I was going to do that to you. But I also promise that by the time we are done with this, my goal is to raise you up in hope. But you're not going to hope in the things I'm going to talk about right now if your hopes are rooted in man. So I hope the first 25 minutes or whatever it was, I hope that was sufficient from God's Word to demolish your hopes in man. Now I want to raise you up. If you're hurting, if you're discouraged, if you're despairing, let's look at God. And the one place where our hopes should be. God wants us to have peace. God wants us to have joy. In fact, He commands us in Philippians 4 to have joy. God wants us to have confidence. God wants us to have strength. But the peace that we're to have, it's rooted in knowing Him. The confidence that we're to have, it's not in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. 2 Corinthians 1, 8-10. <clears throat> uh, I'm sorry, uh, the strength that God wants us to have. It's not our own strength. It's not the strength of a godless community. Rather, the strength that He wants us to have is the strength that God gives us in our weakness as we trust Him by faith. So, having revealed the folly of hoping in sinners, let's now turn our attention to the one worthy of all our hopes. And I don't know about you guys, but in my suffering and in trying to minister to the suffering of others, I am so personally comforted that God speaks into suffering as a God who Himself has suffered. God is not just some distant being who is perfect and knows nothing of the human plight that we brought on ourselves through sin. Instead, in Jesus Christ, God is a God who in every way is familiar with suffering. And in the suffering of God, sinners can find hope in their suffering because the suffering of God in Christ gives purpose to our suffering and in fact, one day, will eradicate it entirely. <coughs> When man, through sin, plunged himself into utter ruin, when he brought suffering of all kinds on himself, and when he brought death to the entire created order, our God did not sit back and do nothing about it. Instead, in Genesis 3.15, right as sin and death and guilt and condemnation and suffering entered the world, God makes a promise in Genesis 3.15. He promised that He would bring a seed or a descendant of Eve who one day would destroy Satan and undo his works. Namely, the introduction of death and sin through lies. God made a promise. As soon as it happened, God made a promise. One's going to come from this woman and destroy the serpent in his works. <clears throat> so what does a good God do when he is all powerful, when he is all loving, when he is all wise, and he is all knowing, and he sees, when he sees all of the suffering and evil man has brought on himself because of sin, what does a God like that do? The Bible tells us that this good God he became a man and He entered into our cursed world. He entered into our suffering. He suffered worse than anyone who ever lived. And then, by His suffering, He provided meaning, hope, purpose, and redemption for sinners. And so through the suffering of God Himself, we can not only has God accomplished these things, but also we can learn so much about school shootings. So let's break it down. To begin, we know that our triune God eternally exists in three persons. There is one God, and that God exists in the three persons of God the Father, God the Son, who is Jesus Christ, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus Christ, as God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, He is fully God, and He is also fully man. He's not half God, half man. Fully God, fully man. And prior to Christ coming to the earth, Jesus was in the presence of the triune God in heaven. And when He was in heaven, He was not being mistreated by anyone in heaven. 
Instead, He was worshipped and honored by angels and heavenly beings. And He was in the presence of the Father. And He enjoyed face-to-face intimacy with His Father. And in a place like that, unlike earth, he was com- there was complete safety and there was nothing but full, undiluted, divine glory. That's where He was before He was born in a manger. Now, Philippians 2 tells us that because of the great love of God, Jesus Christ left this place of glory. And He willingly became a man. And He came to earth. And we know earth is a place that is pulsating with evil and danger and suffering. But Christ came and became a man. And He left a place of glory and comfort and safety. And He entered into this cursed place. And while he lived out his earthly life, oh, how he suffered. When Christ was born, right off the bat, his suffering begins. Christ is the king of the universe, right? That's what the Magi said. We've come to uh, worship the king of the Jews. Christ is a king. Yet he was not born in a glorious palace in Rome. Instead, he was born in a lowly manger found in a barn among animals. And as soon as Jesus was born, there was already a school shooting, if you will. There was already a plot to come and commit mass murder on children. And that plot was from King Herod. King Herod was the king of the Jews at that time and he was jealous of Jesus. So he sent his soldiers to murder Jesus much like a school shooter would. And these soldiers entered Bethlehem and they killed every male child two years and younger. This awful tragedy marked the birth of Christ. Jesus knows what it is to be a human child, to be among other human children, and to know that his peers were killed while he survived. And when a tragedy like a school shooting happens, sometimes surviving children feel what's called survivor's guilt because their friends died while they lived. And so if that's you, or if you have a loved one struggling this way, I just want to encourage you that Jesus Christ knows exactly what this is like. Jesus knows what it is to be a human child and to know that here comes these evildoers, uh, they're coming to kill kids, and He knows what it's like to know His peers were killed while He survived. And rather than suffering from misplaced guilt and shame, Jesus knows that this was not His fault. It was Herod's fault and it was the soldier's fault. And so Jesus continues to entrust Himself to God the Father. And He knows that there is a great purpose for His life. And He knows that because God had another purpose for Christ, that's the reason He survived. Similarly, If you are a survivor of something like a school shooting, if you give your life to Christ, just as God had for His Son, Jesus Christ, so also He has a great future purpose for you. And His purpose isn't, it's not health and wealth and ease and comfort. Instead, His purpose is that you might know Him and love Him and serve Him and be a blessing to other people and minister to other people. Who knows? Maybe you will minister to somebody else who's in a uh, a mass shooting someday. But whatever your future is, if you give your life to God, you don't have to be burdened with survivor's guilt. Your future, like Christ, can be one of worship to God and profitable usefulness. That's the first comfort we can take away from the suffering of Christ. Let's keep going. As Jesus lived out his earthly life, Jesus didn't grow up in the nice part of town. Instead, he grew up in a place called Nazareth, which John 1.46 tells us was a very bad part of town. And as Jesus began his earthly ministry as an adult man, he was often publicly ridiculed. He was scorned. He was made fun of. He was rejected. And he was despised, even by his own people. What's a modern day school term we might use to describe that kind of treatment? 
Everybody's making fun of you. Everybody's rejecting you. Everybody's looking down on you. Everybody's saying bad things about you. What do schools call that? Bullying. In the mistreatment Christ received, in the bullying He received, He did not let that justify Himself in becoming a school shooter. Being mistreated, I'm not trying to say that being mistreated isn't bad, it is. Being mistreated, as bad as it is, it is emphatically no excuse for going on a killing spree or sitting against other people. Listen, if you are truly a good person, you're not going to allow someone sinning against you to, to justify yourself in sinning against other people. I mean, Jesus Christ is proof of that. Jesus is good. He is sinless. When He's bullied, what does He do? Does He respond with killing? No. What came out of Him as He's being bullied? Holiness. Obedience to God. Faithfulness to God. Love. Listen, Jesus was betrayed not just by strangers. His own family rejected Him at certain points. His close friend, namely Judas Iscariot, betrayed Him with a kiss. He was betrayed and mistreated in every single way. But Jesus knew who the, He was. He knew who the Father was. He was secure in His mission. He was secure in the glory of God. And the lies of other people did not destroy Him. So, if you are a student who's being bullied, you don't have to turn to violence. You don't have to turn to drugs. You don't have to turn to sin. Listen, advocate for yourself. Tell the teachers. Try and get them to stop. Do all those things. But listen, know there is another one who's been bullied. God in the flesh has been treated this way. And you're going to look to Him as your example. You look to Him to not retaliate with murder, to not retaliate with sin, but to entrust your soul to one who judges justly. 1 Peter 2. How many school shootings might be prevented if kids who are being bullied knew who God is in Christ? If they knew the identity that's available to them through Jesus Christ? If they knew the love of God through the Gospel? If they knew the presence of God in their life? If they had believers surrounding them? How many might be prevented? There's hope for the bullied school kid. That's you. God Himself knows what it's like to be mistreated in these ways. Let's return to Christ's sufferings. Continue on God's journey of suffering here. Not only was Christ mistreated and slandered and ridiculed, but also He was falsely accused as being a blasphemer, and on the night He was betrayed, He was arrested, He was wrongly imprisoned, He was reviled by thousands, and when the Jews handed Him over to Pontius Pilate, He endured the physical torture of being whipped 39 times. Oftentimes, the beating Christ endured was sufficient to kill a man. He endured not only the torture of these beatings, but He also endured the physical torture of having a crown of thorns placed on His head that cut through His scalp. You ever have the spiritual gift like me where you bonk your head, top of your head on stuff? I have that gift. It's not a good one. But whenever I exercise that gift, I'm always struck like, man, this hurts. And when it happens to me, I think about the Lord. I'm like, man... He had these thorns just cutting into his scalp. It's a super sensitive area of the body. And Jesus was beaten. He had thorns piercing his scalp. And he endured the physical torture of having nails driven through his hands and feet. He was publicly lifted up on a cross. And a cross kills its victims by suffocating them to death. In school shootings, people talk about trauma. You want to talk about trauma? What Jesus went through is serious trauma. And so, if you are someone who has gone through unspeakable trauma, one of the traumatic things about that is you can feel so suffocated and buried in it that you think you can never get out of it. 
The, the, the trauma is so overwhelming. It's going to enslave you all of your life. Listen, God went through trauma. Jesus has gone through it Himself. He is the ultimate trauma victim. And the more that we understand about the meaning of His death, which I'm going to explain in a minute, the more we can be healed and delivered from our trauma by looking to the trauma of Christ. For now, what I want to draw out from this is that if you are a trauma victim, I just want to begin the comfort with comforting you that God Himself has been traumatized. And He knows what this is. He knows what you feel. And it isn't hopeless. It is if you hope in yourself. It is if you hope in man. But if you look to God, it is not hopeless. Now at this point, as we have journeyed through the suffering of God, none of what I've described about Christ's sufferings is the worst part yet. The worst part of the suffering of Christ on the cross came when He bore the wrath of God for sinners. 1 John 3.5 tells us this about Jesus. You know that He appeared in order to take away sin. And in Him there is no sin. Christ Himself is sinless. He never had a sinful thought. He never said a sinful word. He never committed a sinful deed. Instead, He perfectly, with constant fervor, zeal, and passion, loved God with all of His heart, all of His mind, and all of His soul. Unlike you, unlike me, and unlike everyone else who has ever lived, He truly lived the perfect, good, and sinless life. And so, when Jesus went to the cross... Because He had no sins of His own to pay for, He became the sinless sacrifice for our sins. Listen, God is, yes, God is a God of love, but God is also a just and holy God. God doesn't just look at our sin. He doesn't just look on the evil of this planet and then feel indifferent about it and say, ah, I love Him, who cares? I mean, how would you feel if the judge didn't care about the recent shootings? How would you feel if you read in the newspaper that the judge let the shooters go free and he said, ah, oh, yeah, you know what, go back to class. Stan, you got you take these guys back. Would that be a good judge? Of course not. A good judge will bring justice. And our God is a good judge. And we all have sin. And our sin demands that a just penalty be paid. And because God is not only just and holy, but also is loving and gracious, and because God so loved the sinful world, John 3.16, He sent His sinless Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has none of His own sins to pay for. So when He became our substitute on the cross, 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us, Jesus became sin for us. And as Jesus was dying, God actually punished Jesus by pouring His full and undiluted wrath upon Christ as the just penalty for our sin. Now, nobody living, no matter what you're suffering, has ever gone through that. And I'm not trying to minimize anybody's suffering. I'm just lifting up the suffering of Christ. No one has ever endured full wrath of God being poured on them. But that's what Christ endured. And as Christ was dying, God punished Jesus by pouring His full and undiluted wrath on Christ as the just penalty for our sin. Uh, and, and because Jesus, through, by bearing that penalty, He satisfied justice, uh, He satisfied the justice of God. Because He did that, we can be forgiven. Jesus died as an innocent victim. And in tragedies like this, there are always innocent victims. And the innocent victims tend to inspire us, such as the young man who gave up his life so that his classmates would live this last week. That's a good and godly thing. And that sacrifice that he made for his classmates, it points to a greater sacrifice. It points to the ultimate innocent victim. 
the innocent victim who is Jesus Christ, who willingly laid His life down so that anyone who receives Him by faith as their Lord and Savior can be forgiven. Jesus died for us so that we can have eternal life in Him. Isaiah 53, 5, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And upon Him was the punishment that brought us peace. And by His wounds we are healed. Now when Jesus bore the wrath of God and became sin for us, we can learn some more about His suffering and how it might relate to people who are involved in school shootings. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 46, we read that as Jesus was dying on the cross, because a holy God has to turn away from sin, which is what Jesus became on the cross, when God was punishing Him, He actually had to forsake Christ. He, he had to turn away from Him. Jesus cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so, the, the, this awful reality, the Son being separated from the Father when He bore our sin on the cross, that's why Jesus was sweating blood in Gethsemane on the eve of His crucifixion. It wasn't just the physical pain. I'm sure he wasn't looking forward to that. But he knew that he would have to bear the wrath of God and he would be separated from God when he was dying on the cross for sins. All Christ had known for all eternity was perfect intimacy with the Father. And when Christ was separated from the Father and the Father was separated from the Son, this is the terrible reality of what happened when sin was being atoned for. I have no doubt that this broke the heart of our triune God. And if you have ever lost a loved one, if you've ever had a child or a loved one in a school shooting, you know how awful the feeling of separation is. When your child is separated from you, your dear child whom you love, it is an indescribably awful feeling. And when you are the child and you are in a place of danger and you're in a place of suffering and you don't have your parents there with you, it's a gut-wrenchingly awful emotion. And our triune God knows what it is like to experience this separation because it's exactly what happened on the cross. And so this God, God is able to sympathize with us when we go through this agony. God the Father is able to comfort parents who have lost a loved one because He Himself was separated from His Son on the cross. Jesus Christ can comfort grieving children who have lost their parents because He Himself cried out from the cross, My God, my God, why have You forsaken me? So listen, our God, our triune God, He's not cold and distant. He's a God who has suffered. He's a God who loves us. And He's a God who wants to comfort us in Christ. And He can relate to absolutely any kind of hardship we will ever go through. Now as traumatic and painful and difficult as the cross was, the story of the cross does not end in tragedy. Hebrews 12 verse 2 tells us that Jesus endured all of these sufferings that culminated in the cross for the joy that was set before Him. He knew the cross wouldn't be the final word. He knew beyond the cross there was something glorious, something eternal, something that would bring eternal joy. That's what He had His mind fixated on to help Him go through the cross. He knew His suffering wouldn't be the final word. He knew a different ending to the tragedy of His suffering was coming. And after His great trauma, and after His suffering at the cross, after being bullied, after being ridiculed, after being separated from His Father, three days later, Jesus rose from the dead. And in so doing, he showed that His sacrifice for sin was acceptable to God. And because Jesus had successfully atoned for sin, He defeated Satan's works. And He now not only did He defeat Satan's works of, of sin and provide forgiveness from, for us, but by rising from the dead, He also was now victorious over even death as well. 
And after being raised from the dead for 40, for 40 days, Jesus appeared to over 500 of His disciples and He helped them to understand the meaning of His death and resurrection from the Scriptures. And then Jesus ascended into heaven where He appeared before the Father on our behalf as the final sacrifice for our sins. And as He appeared in heaven, Jesus sat down on a throne of grace at the right hand of the Father, which is where He is at this very moment right now. And Philippians 2 tells us that because of the obedient sacrifice of the Son, the Father, God the Father who loves His Son, He exalted Him. And He gave Jesus the name above all names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow before His glory and His splendor. So the joy of being resurrected and exalted like this was before Jesus Christ as He endured the cross. And in addition to these glories... Part of the joy that was set before Jesus was also the salvation of His people. So, having accomplished the work of salvation through His sinless life, His death, and His resurrection, Jesus now makes a sincere offer to all people. And His offer is that if you believe He died for your sins on the cross and that He rose again on the third day and you trust Him alone to save you, not your works, not your parents, not your friends, not your community, not your money, not your righteousness, but you trust Him alone to save you, then through faith, you will be saved and all of your sins will be forgiven because He has paid for them on the cross. And the salvation that Jesus offers, it's something He achieved for us. It's not something we can achieve ourselves or something we can even contribute to. Instead, we look away from ourselves and we receive His salvation as a free gift of God. And so when we surrender our lives to Jesus by faith, here's some things that happen to us. We receive Excuse me. We receive full forgiveness of sins. Romans 8.1 There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. All of the sins we committed as children and teenagers and adults, they are fully forgiven through Jesus Christ. Through His death on the cross, He makes us clean. He makes us new. And though our, skin, our sins are as scarlet, they are now as white as snow in Jesus Christ. Isaiah 1.18 When we come to Jesus Christ by faith, something else happens. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 through 14 tells us that when we believe His gospel, we also receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that when this happens, we become a new creation in Christ. Listen, this is a real thing. This isn't some fake idea. It's a real thing. When we come to Christ, He fills us with His life. He fills us with His Spirit. He changes our evil hearts. He changes us so that we no longer live with the goal of ourselves being our own God. We no longer live with ourselves at the center of our universe. But instead, by the Spirit, we come to love and enjoy the glory of God in Christ. And He becomes our all-consuming passion. We are utterly transformed from the inside out. And we understand through falling in love with the living God, the meaning of Psalm 63.3, which says the steadfast love of the Lord is better than life. God becomes our all in all. And according to Ezekiel 36, verse 25 and 26, by the Spirit of God that dwells in us through our conversion, we now are enabled by God to live a life of genuine love, to live a life of obedience to God, to live a life of holiness, and to live a life of passion for His glory. As new creatures in Christ, we're not just evil wretches anymore like what was described in the beginning of the sermon. Rather, through His great and precious promises, we become partakers of God's divine nature as we are born again through His Spirit. 1 Peter 1, verses 3-8. through And when we come to salvation through Jesus Christ, we come to God 
in our salvation, listen, we are no longer enemies of God. Instead, according to Colossians chapter 1, verse 21 through 23, we are reconciled to God and have a right relationship with Him through the death of Christ. And the way the Bible describes our relationship with God, it's not just some kind of like, cold relationship. Like, have you ever had an enemy and then you're kind of on speaking terms, but you're not really reconciled? You're just sort of like, hey, hey, hey. it's all awkward and weird and you don't really talk. Or That's not the way we're reconciled to God. You know how we're reconciled to God? We're reconciled to God by being adopted into His family. 1 John 3, 2. Oh, how great is the love of God that we should be called children of the living God. Romans 8, verse 15 through 16 tells us through the gospel we become His adopted children. He sends His Spirit into our heart and that Spirit within us, it cries out, Abba, Father, we are so transformed and so brought into a relationship with God that the inner cry of who we are in our new nature is just, Daddy, I love you. And He loves us. That's our reconciliation to God. We become His adopted children. And now, through the Gospel, God is our loving Father. He is with us. He will walk with us. He will love us. And He will guide us in every circumstance. And Romans 8.28 tells us that He will work all things for our ultimate good. Even tragedy. Even trauma. Even suffering. Even loss. Even death. All of these things will become His tool to cause us to know Him more deeply, to cause us to become more like Jesus, and to ensure that we are triumphant in Christ as not even suffering or death can remove the love of God from us. Romans 8, 37-39. And so as believers, having received this salvation in this life, we don't fear suffering or death even though there's nowhere we can go to escape it. Suffering will cause us to grow in the Lord. That's what's promised to us in Romans chapter 5, verse 1 through 5. It's promised in James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4. Suffering will cause us to grow in the Lord. And as it pertains to our death, Psalm 139, verse 16 tells us this. Your eyes saw my unformed substance In your book were written every one of them the days that were formed for me when as yet there was none of them. What that verse means is God is the one who ultimately decides how long we live. In his book were written every single one of our days before any of them even existed. Prior to the day of our death coming, God is going to protect us. You have a set day to die. You can't stop it. You can't even slow it down. God wrote it in a book. And you are immortal until that day comes. And then once that day comes, there is nothing that will save you. You are going to die. And so as believers... We know that our ultimate living and dying is in the hands of God. It's not in security guards. It's not in law enforcement. It's not in procedures. All those things have a good, godly place. But it is ultimately in the hand of God. He determines the days, that, how long we will live. God is the determiner of your life. Jesus said in Matthew 5, you can't even get a gray hair apart from the will of God. Well, if you can't get gray hairs and I can't go bald like this apart from the will of God... Can we die apart from Of course not. Your days are numbered. And so as students, that should give you great confidence. What, do you want to be a slave to fear the rest of your life? Okay, so what if if you decide I'm never going to school again? Okay, well, are you going to go to a mall? Are you going to go to a concert? Because there's been shootings there. Are you going to drive somewhere? Because you can get in a car accident. Are you going to hang out somewhere? Because you can get sick and you can die. Are you going to go hiking? A mountain lion can kill you. Are you going to, uh, you know, a volcano can erupt. A plane can crash. I mean, you can die. There's a trillion ways to die. It only takes one. Not against safety and precautions, but listen. 
God determines your days. So we can face it fearlessly. We are in Jesus Christ. Our sins are forgiven. We are God's children. We have the Spirit of God. We can't die one second before God says. Why on Tuesday did my four kids who go to STEM, why did God strike them with sickness the night before the shooting and have them at home? And why did other kids, why did other parents' kids get shot? On one hand, I don't know. On another hand, I know. Because that was God's will. The reason it wasn't my kids that died is because it wasn't their time. That's what Psalm 139.16 says. And so, as children and as parents, that is extremely comforting. You will be protected every day till it's time to die. But one day that day is going to come. One day that bullet will kill us. One day the sickness will claim our life. One day the natural disaster or the car accident, it will end with us no longer living on this earth. And so as believers, we're not enslaved to the fear of our death day, which the Bible tells us that, again, we can't stop it or slow it down. Instead, we look to the One who has saved us from our sins. We look to the One who has resurrected from the dead. We look to the One who promises believers that when we die, we will immediately be in His presence. Philippians 1.21, Philippians 1.26, 2 Corinthians 5.8. We look to Jesus Christ, the one who was raised from the dead, and we know that just as Christ was raised from the dead, so also He will raise us from the dead. And He will, rene- he will unite our renewed spirits with new bodies that can never be corrupted, that can never get sick, and that can never be killed. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50-57. through 57. So we're of good courage in this life. Because even though we can't escape suffering or death, even though there is no true safe place on this planet, we have a God who in Christ has given us the victory in all of our suffering, even in our death. And as we walk through this life, we don't build our hopes or our our identity on our fragile self-esteem. We don't try to convince ourselves that we're something that we're not. Instead, we know Christ died for our sins. We know He washed us clean. We know He's brought us into a relationship with God. We know He's made us new in Him by the Spirit. We know He holds our lives and works every detail of them for our good. We know He has a heavenly dwelling place waiting for us. We know He will never leave us or forsake us. We know that He will raise us from the dead. And we know we will spend forever with Him in glory where no school shooter will ever enter in or terrorize us. Revelation 21, 3 and 4. There's a place called the new heavens and the new earth. That is where a final, secure, resting place will be realized. That place will be sparkling with the glory of Christ. And we will worship Him forever there in complete, eternal safety. Until we get to that place, we're not there yet. We are pilgrims and aliens and we live in a dangerous world. And our hope is in a God who suffered and who saves us and who is with us and turns our suffering into glory. So, though we are thankful for law enforcement and good legislation and safety procedures and human efforts to prevent crime, we do not put our ultimate hope in those things because they're not God. So how do you function in an age of school shootings? Well, you can deceive yourself and believe false hopes. You can hope in yourself and be destroyed. Or you can come to Jesus Christ for salvation. Trust His promises and the goodness of God. Not fear death not fear suffering, knowing what God will do in those things and live in the joy of the Lord in an age of terror. That is the only real hope. Anybody selling you a hope different than that is lying to you. Look to God. I know this has been long. This is my final exhortation. Luke chapter 13 Verses 1 through 5. I'm going to read it to you. See if any of this sounds familiar. 
There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans who, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered them, Do you think these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Here's this episode of Galileans. Pilate slaughters them. And then they come and ask Jesus about this. What does this mean? And he tells them what it doesn't mean. And then he tells them one thing it does mean. And he doesn't give them anything else. So what it doesn't mean is that the people who were slaughtered, they weren't worse sinners than the people who survived. It's not the case. Sometimes people think that. It's wrong thinking. They weren't worse sinners. That's what it doesn't mean. And then he told us what it does mean. One thing. There's one message to survivors. Unless you repent, you also will perish. And so the message to us in tragedy, for those of us who survive, is it's time to get serious with God. It is time to turn your life and repent and seek Him and make Him part of your life. Stop playing games with Him. Get in the Word of God. Get serious about following Him. Have meaningful membership in the church of Jesus Christ and give your life to Him and seek Him and pursue Him, and pursue Him because on a day you do not expect, your life will be taken. And unless you repent, you likewise will perish. That's the message Jesus has for us in tragedy. It's time for us to be serious about seeking the Lord.